Hello, um, I'm going to talk about um, space law and its relationship with science fiction uh, literature, uh, which I'm really very passionate about. And some of you may have actually read maybe yesterday in the newspaper that Sir Richard Branson um, is actually preparing himself to become an astronaut and that he will take off um, quite soon and that um, his, his space travels is not a question of years but a question of months. And uh, to give another example, um, Elon Musk is even more kind of um, cutting edge with his thinking about going into space. And he's absolutely convinced that by 2022, he will be able actually to, um, to, to travel to Mars and start a Mars uh, colony and have a permanent uh, moon base. So we really see that our relationship with outer space is really quickly kind of changing. And we see that increasingly private companies, private enterprises are actually engaging with uh, space travel. And that is obviously very, very different from the early days of our interaction with, with uh, space travel, which was mainly kind of regulated and, and been undertaken by, uh, by states, by governments, and in particularly the Soviet Union and um, the United States of America. So we're really going into a whole new era of space exploration. And this phenomena uh, is actually being studied by, uh, by sociologists. And what is really interesting is that they are um, they're kind of arguing that if we look into the rhetorics that are being used, particularly um, by Elon Musk, for example, that we see that they're using this language, these private space uh, pioneers, that they're kind of using a language of, of frontier thinking. And it's the same kind of language that, we, that we've actually been using all along history when we're going into other, other territories, when we're going to conquer, when we're going to dispossess uh, people from, um, from their land. So there is a kind of relationship, a long-term kind of historical relationship of thinking about um, you know, going into new frontiers, really expanding our resource frontier. And that is something that I would like to kind of unpack a little bit further um, in, in my talk here. Um, and it, it kind of really throwing up this question, what, what does that kind of resource frontier actually mean in terms of the kind of questions it throws up, uh, how we actually think about property and how we think about sovereignty. And the kind of question that I would like to throw into, into the audience here is, do we actually think that when America planted its flag on the moon, does America, does the United States of America own the moon? Can we actually own the moon? Can we actually mine asteroids and take the resources back to planet Earth and kind of claim ownership over the resources we've been mining? And it's a very complex um, kind of, 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 of question and it really is very difficult actually if we look into international law to answer that question in, in a straightforward manner. And this is why I kind of engage in my research with other sources of law um, and not just international law but I also look into science fiction literature to maybe look um, for some more imaginative answers that what currently international law uh, can give us. So if we, think, if we think a bit further about um, this whole idea of, of claiming property rights, it's actually not just something new. And the first kind of really kind of wacky claim that's been made over the moon was in 1757 when the uh, Russian, uh, sorry, the Prussian uh, emperor, um, Frederick the Great, he actually gave um, as a reward uh, to, to the family Jurgens because they were very much involved in, in all the, the, the warfares and, and expanding the territory of the uh, Prussian Empire. And as a token of appreciation, he actually gave to the Jurgens family ownership over the moon. Um, but an example that some of you may be more familiar with um, is the example of uh, Dennis Hope, who actually started and formed in 1980 a lunar embassy. And what he did, he carved up um, the moon in three million parcels. And you can actually um, buy a parcel of, of the moon. Uh, you have to pay roughly about $30. Uh, and in return, through the post, you will get the title deeds showing that you are the owner of that particular parcel on the moon. You also get a copy of the constitution, the lunar constitution. You get a bill of rights and you get a booklet uh, with a story uh, uh, sort of giving you the answer, you own what. 
And obviously these are very speculative uh, kind of appropriations and we do not have to take them any serious. But if we, you know, if we, if we think about the kind of era we're currently in with this kind of really big pressure around mining and tourism in outer space, we're kind of moving into a whole different uh, kind of, 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 of idea around maybe it is possible to own, um, you know, a settlement on Mars or to, to mine and own these resources um, uh, if we go to, to asteroids to, to mine. And there is this, you know, because technology and science is kind of really quickly uh, changing, there is this, among scientists, uh, a really strong kind of belief that in the next 50 to 100 years, we will be able to do these kind of endeavors, that we will be able to maybe have a, a settlement on Mars, or maybe more realistically, that we start mining for natural resources uh, in outer space. And even um, Stephen Hawkins really believed that, um, you know, if, if, if humankind wants to, wants to preserve itself and wants to, to continue in its existence, given um, the kind of very difficult um, climatic changes we're going uh, under, the, the kind of environmental stresses uh, that our uh, planet is currently experiencing, that we cannot just rely on this single planet and that maybe in terms of kind of preserving and, and, and protecting humankind and its existence in the future, that we may actually have indeed have to go into outer space and start uh, these new settlements in for, on, for example, uh, Mars. So there is this whole idea that because of the environmental pressures, climate change, etc., that we might need to have a life raft and that we actually have to take um, you know, they have to take up these, these really new, exciting kind of challenges of going um, into outer space. But, you know, if we talk about this kind of private, um, private endeavors of, of, of uh, going into outer space and mining and maybe settlements and tourism, often when, when private entrepreneurs, when they invest so much money, because obviously this is so expensive to go into, into outer space, they want to have a reward. This is how our economy actually often works, um, that when you invest something, you want to have a return. And that is often being regulated through having private property rights. That's kind of the incentive for people, for, for private entrepreneurs to invest first. They want to have a kind of guarantee by securing whatever they appropriated that were, for which they have invested so much money, that they actually can uh, have ownership over what they're going to mine, for example. And this is where national governments are starting to play a really big kind of role and where we really see a big kind of change in outer space law that in the past, um, in the 60s, that it was very much regulated through these international uh, arrangements. We see that with this new kind of pressure of, of private companies uh, really trying to go into outer space, that national governments are starting to play a really big kind of role and really start to facilitate uh, going into outer space by creating a legal platform that actually may allow this kind of ownership and property rights over outer space and the resources we're going to mine. And there's two examples, and I think you're probably not surprised when I say that the United States of America has drafted legislation in 2015 allowing uh, American uh, companies, American citizens to go into outer space to use, to appropriate, and to own natural resources mined in outer space. But even a country like Luxembourg, which is obviously more of a, of a surprise maybe, has also promulgated uh, legislation in 2017, also facilitating this legal kind of platform and trying to create certainty that when companies go into outer space, that they would be able to create uh, this kind of ownership regime, this kind of exclusive property rights over um, the resources they would like uh, to mine. And that throws up really interesting kind of questions around, is this actually according to international law? Is this actually allowed? Can, can, is, it, is, is, is it possible to create this kind of legal platform where companies can go into the outer space, start mining, owning these resources when they're being brought back um, to, 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 to Earth? So we have to go back into history and we have to go back into the kind of really beginnings and the initial ideas around this kind of outer space uh, society and how are we going to regulate that and what kind of governing regime 
we're going to create for us to use um, outer space as this new kind of resource frontier. And what was really a kind of game changer and was really the kind of important seed for outer space law was actually already in the Second World War uh, with the V1 and the V2 uh, rockets. But the most important kind of moment that was really a big kind of change was when um, uh, the Sputnik, uh, Sputnik 1, Sputnik 2 were uh, launched by, um, the satellites were launched by uh, the Soviet Union in, um, in the end of, of the 1950s. And that was quickly followed by the United States trying to, 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 to do something similar, but their um, rocket, the Vanguard, actually exploded. And that created an, almost a kind of psychosis and a huge scare and, and um, a, a really big kind of existential angst almost that actually um, that the Soviet Union was able to go into outer space, maybe start a military basis uh, in outer space. And um, the whole idea was that at that time, within international kind of the context of the UN, that that needed to be prevented. That outer space had to be this place where we're actually going to, where we, we can't have this, this, this kind of um, military uh, bargaining almost between the Soviet Union and um, the United States of America. That outer space, that going into outer space had to be for pe peaceful purposes. That it had to be kind of preserved for, for humankind, that we all had to have access to it, but for very peaceful uh, kind of circumstances, for very peaceful kind of conditions and uses. So we see that in uh, 67, we have the first uh, international uh, treaty on the outer space. Um, and subsequently, we have four other really different uh, important international treaties and uh, agreements regulating uh, on all different kind of levels our space governing and how we're actually going to, you know, how we're going to regulate um, um, going into outer space. Um, but it's particularly the Outer Space Treaty which is really important because that one has been signed by a lot of spacefaring uh, nations and has been ratified uh, by enough countries to become international law. And the Moon Agreement, which is also a very important international legal document, uh, unfortunately, that was not signed by a lot of nations and spacefaring nations of that time were not, um, were not signing and as such, it has never been ratified and is in a way a failed international um, agreement. So we have to look into the Outer Space um, Treaty to kind of find an answer to this question, actually, can we own property on moon? Can we actually own the moon? Can we own Mars? Or can we actually mine resources? Can we mine asteroids for their resources and own, and own them? And this is where it's a bit of a tragedy almost because the Outer Space Treaty doesn't give us a very clear answer. And whilst it's very clear that the purpose uh, for in the Outer Space Treaty and, and the purpose that we kind of foresee is that the outer space needs to be used for peaceful kind of purposes, that is very clear. Because of that, um, it's really clear in its language to say that, um, that we can't, uh, you know, that, that uh, countries cannot extend their sovereignty into outer space. They cannot make this claim, so America planting their flag is not meaning that America's jurisdiction, you know, that it can own um, the moon. But what is not very clear in the Outer Space Treaty is the fact that we cannot have private companies claiming ownership over resources. That language is very ambiguous and very vague in the Outer Space Treaty. So whilst it's very clear that it needs to be protected for the benefit of <coughs> humankind, it is also saying that we should be able to use the resources, that we should be able to use outer space for the benefit of humankind. And it's not clear that that use and that, that, that using these outer space for the benefit of humankind, does it prevent or does it allow uh, private companies to actually go into outer space and start mining. The, the language isn't clear. So it's a real, um, you know, we, we really kind of confronted now with a huge dilemma that we need to think about, we need new international law, we need to think about how we're going to govern this with, with private entities like, um, you know, Elon Musk uh, and, and Sir Richard Branson. We see there's so much, um, Gusto to go into outer space that we really need to think about how are we going to govern this. And this is where science fiction literature becomes for me an important source of law. 
And science fiction literature is often being used, even within legal studies, as a source of law, because it allows this kind of utopian thinking. If we analyze science fiction literature as a source of law, we may see more a kind of imaginative, creative understanding of what sovereignty may actually mean. And maybe we find a way of thinking more critically about property, and that we maybe start to challenge some of the, 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 the kind of really important institutions that have been guiding us in law, how to, how to make a claim, how to, you know, how to claim ownership over, um, over, over a resource, or how we have used law to justify expropriating and, and dispossession, dispossession, dispossessing people um, from their land. Um, and, and it is this kind of utopianism in science fiction literature that really interests me to find these really interesting um, ideas. And just to end um, this, um, this talk, I just want to um, highlight a work by Kim Stanley Robinson. And if there are any science fiction um, literature fans in this audience, some of you may be familiar with his Mars trilogy, where it's a, it's a very interesting um, uh, kind of a trilogy where, where Kim Stanley Robinson is really trying to hold us accountable by, by thinking about a Mars settlement, a Mars colony, how we should rethink some, some of our notions around property and the constitution and how we're going to, you know, how we're going to regulate our relationship with the environment. And he have, he's having over three different kind of volumes, this huge kind of debate. Are we going to change the environment of Mars so we can actually live there? Can we terraform Mars to an extent that we humans can survive there? Or are we going to leave it? Are we going to stay, let's kind of minimize um, the, the, our involvement with Mars? So it, it, it has this kind of intrinsic rights um, of itself. But he's also asking really in interesting kind of questions about property and ownership. And he's, uh, it, it takes about three volumes to come to this, um, well, the, the Dorsa, Brivia Dorsa um, Declaration, which is a kind of constitutional um, declaration uh, for the Mars settlement, where we really see that private ownership is not allowed um, and that where it really sets out some really important ethical kind of questions, how we actually need to be so different and so imaginative and really move away from these, these kind of old-fashioned kind of institutions of sovereignty and property that have been guiding us in, in our quest into the old kind of resource frontiers that has guided us to, to have this West frontier in the Americas. So I hope, uh, and this is where I would like to end my talk, I really hope that our private entrepreneurs like um, you know, Elon Musk and, and Sir Richard Branson that are actually science fiction fans and that they are actually reading the Mars trilogy and that hopefully you know, that they really think very carefully how we are actually going to manage, how we are actually going to govern um, outer space. Thank you.